Welcome to our presentation showing the results of an in-house study about the effects from COVID-19 vaccination on the dynamics of methane concentration in bread. My name is Daniela Polak and I'm a postdoctoral scientist in the working group of biogeochemistry led by Frank Kepler, which is part of the Institute of Earth Sciences of Heidelberg University in Germany. For almost 10 years, one of our research focuses lies on methane emission of human bread. In this context, we study breath methane emission using high precision analytics. We focused on different research aspects, including long-time breath methane monitoring. We try to answer questions such as which factors control methane concentration in breath and might breath methane be used as a biomarker. But first, let's come to the basics of methane. Methane, as one of the simplest hydrocarbons, is present in the Earth's atmosphere, currently at a global mean concentration of 1.9 parts per million by volume. Methane has both natural and anthropogenic sources. It is a known potent greenhouse gas with an atmospheric lifetime around 12 years and a global warming potential that is 28 times that of carbon dioxide. It is produced either by natural or anthropogenic sources. The largest natural source of atmospheric methane are wetlands. The most dominant anthropogenic source are agriculture, including anaerobic methane production in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants, as well as waste management. Generally, methane is produced by either chemical or biological processes. For a long time, methane formation of eukaryotes was considered to only occur from the metabolism of methanogens, which are microorganisms that belong to the domain Archaea. Those microorganisms live under anaerobic conditions in wetlands, rice fields, landfills, or the gastrointestinal tracts of ruminants, termites, and even humans. However, in 2006, it was demonstrated that also various plants from the domain of eukaryotes are able to produce methane under aerobic conditions without the contribution by microbes. Since then, many studies have unambiguously confirmed direct methane formation and release from eukaryotes, including plants, fungi, lichens, and marine and freshwater algae, without the contribution of methanogenes and in the presence of oxygen. In addition, it has recently been discovered that cyanobacteria, belonging to the domain bacteria, thriving in terrestrial and aquatic environments, are able to endogenously generate methane at substantial rates depending on the species and environmental conditions. While methanogenes, which are obligate anaerobes, produce methane during their metabolism, the requirements and pathways for methane production by non-methanogenic cells are poorly understood and are the subject of current research. However, this observation raises the question if this process can also be detected in humans. In the late 60s, methane was detected as a component in the exhaled breath of humans. In this respect, methane is assumed to mainly reflect intestinal gas formation by microorganisms located in the distal part of the colon. So far, two methanogenic species isolated from human feces have been identified, the hydrogenotrophic Methanobabybacter smithi and the methylotrophic Methanosphera statmanae. Both species identified require hydrogen for the reduction steps leading to methane formation. A fraction of the methane produced is excreted via the lungs and can be detected by specific gas analysis. The proportion of methane in exhaled breath has been investigated in numerous studies. However, most of these studies only differentiate between breath methane producers and breath methane non-producers. Subjects are defined as methane producers when they emit breath methane at least 1 ppm above background, which represents the inhaled air. Based on this definition, approximately 25% of people can be can be identified as methane producers. However, based on our previous high precision analytical results, we expand the definition range to the shown classification. Thus, we differentiate between low emitter slide absorbers, showing a range of methane values slightly above and below background values. Between 1 to 4 ppm above background, 
people were classified as medium emitters and beyond 4 ppm as high emitters. So what are the reasons for the difference in breath methane emission? The methane producing status has been the subject of numerous studies evaluating relationships with age, gender, ethnic background and various gastrointestinal diseases. A few years ago, we clearly demonstrated a correlation between the percentage of breath methane producers and age, and also revealed an age dependence on the ratio of female to male producers. Moreover, a long-term monitoring study of breath methane production reveals a high dynamic range. For all three subjects monitored, breath methane producing status occasionally changed from medium high emission to low emission, which could partly relate to a change in diet or gastrointestinal complaints and might reflect a change in microbial activity. However, on a larger number of occasions, these changes occurred by unknown factors. Specifically, increased production of methane following influenza infections might be linked to a different mechanism of methane production. Thus, the previous observations raises the question if, similarly to plants where it has been shown that environmental stressors enhance methane formation drastically, cellular oxidoreductive stress might influence aerobic methane productions in humans as well. A recent publication summarizes the current state of research of non-archaeal methane formation in eukaryotes, including hypotheses about endogenous sources and pathways, and the potential bioactive role of methane in cellular physiology as a marker of oxidoreductive stress. To further validate the proof of concept that methane is formed endogenously in combination with immune reactions and might be used as an oxidative stress biomarker, we evaluate the effect from current vaccines against COVID-19 on breath methane dynamics. In this context, we took advantage of the current high vaccination rate of COVID-19 vaccinations. Thus, we carried out an in-house study where breath methane were monitored for 13 subjects prior and after the first and second injection of several COVID vaccines. Here is a short overview of the key data of the study showing information on subjects gender, age, administered COVID-19 vaccines, physical discomfort due to vaccination, methane produ producing status and the ob observed breath methane range before and after vaccination. In total, we studied the breath methane of 13 subjects, 6 male and 7 female between 23 and 61 years, obtaining different COVID-19 vaccines. Breath methane monitoring prior to vaccination was carried out daily to weekly to resolve the basic variation which showed a range between minus 102 ppb to 65,000 ppb or 65 ppm below and above background. For measurement of the breath methane samples, a gas chromatograph equipped with a flame ionization detector was used. Analytical precision of the measurement is 5 ppb. Following vaccination, Breath methane samples were collected in high resolution, showing a breath methane range which varied between minus 1000 ppb to 77,000 ppb. In the following, individual breath methane responses are shown, divided according to observed breath methane patterns after vaccination. The following graphics show the individual results on breath methane dynamics following the first and second COVID-19 vaccination. On the timeline, zero represents the time of vaccination. In case of breath methane values, inhaled air or background air is subtracted from the measured breath sample to obtain endogenous methane production and consumption. Thus, zero on the y-axis means that breath methane concentration is equal to background methane concentration. Positive values indicate endogenous methane production, whereas negative values represent methane consumption. To point out deviations from normal conditions, the breath methane variation range 14 days prior to vaccination is included in the plot, represented by the slight colored box, red in case of the first vaccination and green for the second vaccination. The first five subjects presented here show an abrupt decrease in breath methane within the first few hours after vaccination, whereas methane values even dropped 20 to minus 200 
PPD below the level of background air, indicating temporary methane consumption. Afterwards, methane values show a short-term increase within the first 12 to 24 hours subsequent to vaccination, up to levels above the regular upper methane range by a factor of 1 to 5. In general, the first vaccination shows a greater impact on methane dynamics, but in some cases, methane dynamics show a greater range after the second vaccination, as can be seen here. However, the following two subjects show an immense one-time peak shortly after vaccination, also more pronounced for the first vaccination. In comparison to the short-term patterns, vaccination also had longer-term impacts, as could be seen for the three subjects shown here, who show a long-term decrease of methane after vaccination. In case of the third subject shown here, the same pattern was observed for tick-borne encephalitis vaccination, thus confirming that methane dynamics following vaccination is characterized by an individual pattern. In contrast to the long-term decrease, those two subjects here show a slow increase of methane values with a maximum reached after 3 to 4 days and a fully decrease to regular values after 9 to 14 days. The most extreme dynamics can be found for the subjects with a cross-vaccination of AstraZeneca-BioNTech. Breath methane values increased and decreased by a factor of 100 compared to the base range. After the first vaccination, breath methane values even dropped to minus 1000 ppb below background. Such a negative value has never been observed before. In contrast, after the second vaccination, extreme positive values occurred, expressed by a wave-like pattern decaying in a daily period. Comparing the range of breath methane values before and subsequent to the first vaccination here, Masking the extreme values shows that the range of values becomes much narrower after vaccination by a factor of 3. This phenomenon was not observed for any other subject. As a result, most of the subjects showed a strong response in breath methane release a few hours to days after vaccination, including peak values varying by a factor of up to 100 plus minus compared to the base values. Based on the observed direction and time span of the methane breath dynamics, we can distinguish between different patterns. Short-term reactions occurred already a few minutes to hours subsequent to vaccination. In contrast, in case of long-term reactions, the backshift to normal values required up to 14 days, which corresponds to the indicated immunization period of vaccination. Apart from the breath methane dynamics observed in combination with vaccination, there seems to exist a general relationship between physical condition and breath methane. To quantify the actual health status, two subjects evaluated subjectively their physical condition on a numerical basis prior to breath methane measurements. One represents good health conditions, whereas five indicates bad conditions. The subjective well-being of the subjects seem to be clearly correlated to methane production. Thus, allergic complaints and a gastritis occurring during the measurement period and are associated with bad physical condition is accompanied by a higher breath methane production. This increased methane production following immune reactions due to infections might be linked to a specific mechanism of methane production. Inflammation caused by bacterial and viral infection is known to lead to an elevated level of reactive oxygen species as part of the immune response and might be the reason for the strong increase in methane production observed here. Although our study is rather limited in the number of subjects, it clearly shows an effect on breath methane dynamics following COVID-19 vaccination. We are able to distinguish between different short and long-term patterns which seem to be independent from the chosen vaccine or the degree of physical complaints due to vaccination. Factors showing a probable relationship are age and methane emission status, possibly interrelated. 
Short-term patterns with a period of one to two days until base level is reached again occur preferentially with a lower average age and or a low methane emission status. In contrast, long-term patterns are observed for a higher average age and or median to high methane emission status. This could provide an explanation for the observation that the percentage of significant fat methane producers increases with increasing age. Thus, the typical phenomenon of age-related increase of systemic inflammation might be one factor which raises the methane level beyond the limit of low breath methane emitters. The methane dynamics in breath observed in this in-house study might provide further support for the recently formulated hypothesis that humans might also produce and even consume methane without microbes. It is a proof of principle that methane production and consumption are linked to increased hypoxic events and redox regulation during immune reactions and inflammatory processes stimulated by vaccination in this case. As an outlook of this observational study, we can formulate the following questions. Do the observed methane dynamics after vaccination give us insight into individual immune responses and could one possibly classify different immune types? What are the biochemical pathways and underlying processes of non-microbial methane formation and consumption? Can methane in breath used as a gaseous biomarker or gaseous transmitter? However, further investigations are necessary to provide clear evidence of non-microbial methane production in humans and the underlying processes of its formation. This will be a considerably challenge since methane production by methanogens is a domain dominant process in case of medium to high emitters and will make it difficult to distinguish the microbial pathway of methane production from the non-microbial pathway. This means there's still a lot to do and I thank you for attending. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Please contact me for questions or further suggestions. Goodbye.